Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Civil War Art, an online professional development workshop sponsored by the Florida Virtual School Teaching American History Project and the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm, Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating the session this morning. Before we get underway, I would just want to uh, announce that our latest uh, online uh, toolbox will be available next week. I've told you about these before. These are teaching anthologies that offer a wide range of primary documents contextualized with notes and discussion questions. Our newest one is called Making the Revolution, America 1763 to 1791. It's one of our most ambitious yet. It includes nearly 150 items, a wide range of materials, sermons, broadsides, poems, stories, maps, images, and many of these are available online for the first time. We've scoured archives all over the country to bring you fresh material. So next time you're getting ready to teach the uh, revolutionary period, please take a look at Making the Revolution. I think you'll find some fresh uh, approaches and fresh documents uh, in there for uh, use with your students. Uh, as always, I want to remind you about the, uh, the Civil War Arts uh, uh, website. Uh, there you'll be able to find a recording of this seminar, the PowerPoint, and the evaluation. We would urge you to use the PowerPoint for your instructional purposes. Take from that whatever you would like. Uh, and again, complete your evaluation and submit it to us. You will find the evaluation at the website. And uh, again, these are very important to us, and they're important to your Teaching American History Project as well. Are there any questions before we get underway today? Any, any questions? You want to chat anything in or raise a hand and uh, pose a question? Okay, if we're ready to proceed, everybody shoot me a little smiley face so that I know we're ready to go and that everything is uh, fine down there in Florida. Okay, great. It looks as if we are all indeed ready to go. So let's move ahead then to, to uh, our discussion of Civil War art. If you uh, participated in the forum before the seminar, you know that there are several really good questions uh, raised. First of all, we saw a very strong interest in the photographs of Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner. And in addition to that, people asked uh, how their battlefield images affected viewers. Were they reproduced in newspapers? Were battlefield photographs censored in any way? And did either side use images as propaganda? All excellent questions. We're very pleased to have with us today Kirk Savage, a professor of art history at the University of Pittsburgh, to help us address those questions. Kirk's area of research is art of the United States. You see uh, two of his works there, and I want to uh, uh, give an endorsement to Standing Soldiers, Kneeling Slaves, Race, War, and Monument in 19th Century. We used that here at the Humanities Center in a seminar a few years ago, and it is a fine book and will help explain how <clears throat> people in the uh, uh, late 19th century came to interpret uh, the Civil War. So let me turn the program over to Kirk, who will take us through uh, a exploration of Civil War art. Kirk, it's all yours. All right, well, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to have you all um, here. I'm glad to be here and uh, look forward to your comments and, and questions as we go on. I, I did have a chance to look at the forum last night and responded to some of you. Um, were a lot of really interesting issues that came up there. So I, my understanding is we'll have um, uh, some more opportunity after the, the webinar is over to uh, continue with the forum, and I'll be happy to do that in the next week or so. But let me, let me go back to those questions that um, some of which came up in the forum. And I thought I would address some of these right away because they'll help give us some, I think, background information that will help us understand how these images were circulated and used um, and understood at the time. Uh, so we will get to the issue of how battlefield um, images affected, affected viewers. That's a very, actually a really com complicated question, hard to answer, but we'll get to that when we talk about the photographs. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about the question of how they were reproduced and circulated and whether they were censored or used for propaganda purposes. Um, photographs were, could not be directly reproduced in newspapers at this period of time because the technology didn't exist, the, the so-called halftone uh, screen printing process didn't exist until, I believe, the late 1880s. So um, photographs were, uh, could be uh, printed on, um, Original photographs could be printed on paper and actually uh, 
purchased, uh, sold commercially, and a lot of most of these Civil War battlefield images were in fact sold commercially by the photographers and the companies that made them. Um, but they weren't reproduced in, in newspapers. They tended to be, you know, uh, collected and compiled in catalogs that people could order in various different formats, from small little kind of small prints to stereoscope stereoscopic images and larger prints. So we occasionally get um, photographs reproduced in newspapers by um, a woodcut engraving process, which is basically artists who had to redraw the photograph and create a woodcut um, engraving that was then and published in places like Harper's Weekly, which were, these were the first kind of illustrated news magazines, but they were doing them um, strictly with prints, a printmaking process rather than reproduction of newspapers. Kirk, Kirk could I interrupt? Could you speak up, please? Some people are having a little difficulty okay. hearing you. All right, I will, uh, I think my, my Microphone's on all the way. Yeah, <clears throat> but I noticed I kind of have a frog in my throat this morning, so I'll, I'll just That's better. shout. Okay, is that better? All right. That's better. Great. Thank you. Um, so, um, so they so they were not reproduced in newspapers, um, but uh, sometimes um, prints after uh, that were made after by artists um, you know, copying the photographs in another medium. Uh, were they uh, censored? And the, uh, the short answer to that is, is no, um, because first of all, these, these photographs were produced, you know, they weren't produced by the government. They weren't taken um, by, there were no kind of official army photographers the way that, you know, we understand them now, like in the Vietnam War. Um, these were photographs that were actually produced by entrepreneurs like Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner who had their own private commercial photography practices and they copyrighted the images themselves and um, sold them themselves. And so no, there was no, and there was no attempt by the government to censor uh, these images. And there's some pretty extraordinarily gory images out there that were available for sale and uh, people did in fact buy them. Uh, were they used as propaganda? <clears throat> Again, um, this question um, is a little bit different. You know, the answer to this question is a little bit different from what we are used to nowadays because the government wasn't, you know, this was not the way in which this war was conducted. Uh, we don't, don't have the kind of centralized military bureaucracy in the 19th century that we have today. Um, and so there wasn't nearly as much control of images or spin of images by the government. In any case, um, uh, they, they were pretty much for the business of um, controlling, doctoring, spinning images and photographs. However, uh, there, <clears throat> the way some of these images were used in, for example, the illustrated newspapers, or even in books that were published after the Civil War, clearly had a, an ideological slant to them. So they were, they were typically union driven because the South really didn't have the resources, the Confederacy didn't have the, the resources to, um, to really produce these photographs or to produce much in the way of illustrated you know, news at, in that period of time. Uh, so magazines like Harper's Weekly, for example, which published a lot of Civil War imagery, was a very strongly union, pro-union uh, paper. And we'll see, we'll come up with some examples as we go through the images there. We'll, we'll, there's one example in particular that we're gonna actually start off with, which <clears throat> we could think of as a kind of propaganda image, an image that was designed, you know, really to create, bolster support for um, the morale, of, uh, to both bolster morale for the war on the home front in the early part of the war. But it was done, you know, by, magazine and largely probably driven by issues of uh, not just ideology but circulation uh, as well and economics. Now, finally, the final example I wanted to give you, which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, when we come to the photographs, is one of the most famous photographic uh, documents of, of the war is this book called uh, Gardner's Photographic Sketchbook of the War that, that Alexander Gardner created and published 
1866, a year after the war concluded. That also has a very strong kind of ideological bent to it, pro-union. Uh, and so there are ways in which the images in that book are used um, really to support a very, you know, a particular point of view. Um, I, but I should also remind you that those, this was a very limited circulation book because the photographs were actually original photographs in an album. Uh, it's, it's essentially what the book was a photographic album, so there were only a few hundred of them made. Kirk, well, Kirk, let me ask a question. You mentioned that the South didn't have the technology <clears throat> um, to reproduce the pictures. Were there any Southern photographs of the Civil War at all? I mean, I think most people, I've never run across them. I suspect most people haven't either. Were there any at all? Um, yeah, I have seen, there were some studios that were operating in um, the Deep South, like in the New Orleans area. Um, and um, I have seen some photographs um, from those, but they, they weren't battle imagery, but you know, more portrait kinds of photographs of soldiers mm -hmm. and so on. But even those are pretty rare because in those, for example, New Orleans, you know, was taken by the Union pretty early in the war. So all of those photographic studios, you know, couldn't be used for Confederate purposes. Um, so uh, there are some, but they are, I think they're very rare. Um, and so the photographic record that we have of the war is just overwhelmingly a Union record. Right. So no battlefield photographs from the South, mostly poor. Not at all. No. Okay. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. <clears throat> okay. So um, we have um, divided up the seminar into four parts. And I've thrown a fair number of images into the PowerPoint and really too many for us to discuss in 90 minutes, at least to discuss with equal care. So what I'll be probably doing is focusing on a few images uh, and uh, moving through the others a lot more quickly. But if there are any that particularly grab your attention that you do want to spend more time on, I'm really happy to do so. So just, you know, put in a, a request through the chat or um, however you want to communicate that to Richard and we'll definitely, we can slow down and spend more time on, on any given image um, in the PowerPoint. So we're going to begin with this uh, image of War for the Union Bayonet Charge, which is one of these woodcut engravings that was produced for Harper's Weekly after a sketch, it was based on a sketch done by Winslow Homer, supposedly at the site of the battle itself. Now, <clears throat> this reminds me of a, an issue that came up a couple of places in the forum where there was a suggestion that was made that uh, a question about how best to use imagery in the classroom, whether it was best to give a lot of contextual information first and then show an image or one other person had the suggestion of showing an image at the beginning of class, having students write a little bit about it, then talking a lot more about the history of that period and what the subject matter in the illustration and coming back to it maybe at the end of the class, which I thought was a really nice idea, particularly for some images. But this might be an, an example of an image that would be interesting to show students at the beginning without really much contextual background and to see kind of how they, what they come up with. And then through a process of, of, of discovery and learning about the um, process, the, 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 the actual way in which battles were fought, uh, come back and have them really look at it differently uh, over the course of, say, you know, an hour class. So <clears throat> this is one of the reasons we put this image up, of course, Winslow Homer is one of the most famous 19th century American artists, and he began his career as an illustrator for Harper's Weekly, creating <clears throat> these sorts of sketches. And he was, so to speak, embedded with the Union Army uh, <laughs> during the Peninsula Campaign, which is when this was happening in 1862. Um, and I'm going to go back to the questions here. The discussion, the questions I thought we could throw open for a discussion were how likely it was that Homer had witnessed this kind of um, battle. Um, how did he design the scene? 
to bolster home front morale and how did his image reflect old tactics and old ideals of battle. <clears throat> so if we take a, a look at this, you know, what do you think are the most important elements of this image? You know, why is why has he represented the scene the way he has and what is he emphasizing here in this picture? Okay. We have some comments in the chat. Uh, this would be a powerful one for students showing them the brutality of war. And Patrick Jones notes this is hand-to-hand -hand personal combat. Right. So that idea of hand-to-hand -hand personal com uh, com combat, which is very front and center in this in this image, <clears throat> the um, the actual human conf confrontation of man on man in close range to one another as if this is the kind of decisive point of the battle at which the two sides come together and clash, you know, within feet or inches of, um, of one another. How realistic do we think this kind of, uh, do you think this kind of image is? This image of a sort of personalized hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, and while we're waiting for comments on that, a number of people have noted the strong emotion of the of the scene and the uh, the predominance of the uh, the Union uh, uh, soldiers. Um, it shows Absolutely. the raggedness of mm -hmm. the raggedness of the Southerners and Union side looking strong and moving forward. You do, that's true. You do have that definite sweeping uh, motion from the, the left side of the picture uh, toward the right, and yes. uh, the left side dominates the uh, the picture. Very good point. And, you know, we read left to right. And so clearly Homer has set up the picture so that we read left to right and we see the Union Army sweeping from left to right across the um, horizontal frame of the picture, sort of literally, almost literally pushing the Confederates out of the picture plane, out of the picture. Uh, so they're confined to kind of the, the quarter or th uh, third, really more like a quarter of the actual um, space of the page on the far right and they're getting shoved out. So it's clearly representing uh, an overwhelming Union uh, victory, a sweeping kind of bayonet charge that is that is routing the Confederates out of the picture. Samantha Bowman here makes an interesting comment. She talks about the, uh, the light and darkness in the picture and um, she notes that it looks as if the Union is bringing light to the South. Yeah, there's that portion right in the kind of center right, this highly illuminated portion of the um, of the picture that I think um, could it could well be symbolic. Um, you know, the idea obviously the idea of light is is very symbolic, um, and um, uh, also is associated with you know triumph. Light is associated with triumph as well. Uh, it also creates a really strong contrast between those two figures, the dark, the figures that are darker so that you can really see clearly the action that's going on between the two of them. Uh, so there's that space in the center that, that's the kind of gap between the two armies. Right. We have another comment here that's really interesting. There is one of the Union men who look, that looks almost like Lincoln. And I think, I think Barbara is, perhaps she's talking about the fellow at the very back there, um, the upper left-hand side. Um, I, I scanned the picture when uh, when Barbara mentioned that, and he, he, that's the guy I would say who does look like Lincoln. <laughs> a lot of them might. Um, any anything there, uh, Kirk? Uh, any um, uh, was was uh, Homer trying to slip Lincoln into this picture? Do you think? <laughs> Possibly. You know, I'd never thought about that, but that's actually an interesting point. I think I'm seeing the figure you're talking about, the far left of the image, um, and uh, he did slip Lincoln into some other images. Uh, and so uh, it's not at all unlikely that he might have been um, uh, thinking along those lines um, to create a figure that kind of represents um, the leader, the national leader. And it's interesting that he's at the far left of the picture uh, as well. So yeah. Peter Billingsley has a good question. How long would it take to produce uh, a woodcut of this detail? And would one person be responsible or many artists? OK, that's a great question. So actually. Um, it's a combination of many people who are involved in the process. Um, Homer himself made a sketch, and then he sent the sketch. The sketch was sort of, you know, I mean, literally a drawing, which then he would send to New York, 
and a courier to New York. And then that drawing was used as the basis for creating a much larger uh, size woodcut. And the woodcut was actually uh, divided by a grid into squares and different people would, uh, different engravers, you know, sort of skilled engravers would work on each square of the grid. And that way they could get it done uh, really, really quickly. So it was a kind of industrial process, actually. I mean, it was done, everything was done by hand and it was done by people who had to be skilled. But it, they had worked out a way to create a kind of assembly line process to get the image from sketch, from original artist sketch to reproduction fairly quickly within a matter of a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Eric, we have some really good eyes looking at these pictures. Uh, Henry Couch notes that the only bandaged soldiers are rebels. And you'll see one there right in the lower right hand right. foreground who's bandaged. Uh, does this represent a depleted <clears throat> force uh, for propaganda purposes? Yeah, and again, I would say that yes, um, it is part of um, pretty much everything in this image as Homer's created it is meant to give you the impression that the Confederates are losing and depleted and the Union forces are uh, strong and winning. And so even though there are casualties on the Union side, um, in other words, there are men who are being sacrificed, uh, and that's you know, obviously part of the nature of war. They are being lost in the process of a Union triumph. And, and so um, I think it's very important to think of this image as very self-consciously designed. Probably Homer himself, I would guess, was maybe even given instructions <laughs> to create an image that was going to show a Union victory. Because if we actually look at what, what was going on in the Peninsular Campaign at this period of time, this was a disastrous, this was the McClellan's campaign in the summer of 1862 where he was attempting to get to Richmond. The idea was to, you know, he landed off the coast, the idea was to work their way inland, capture the Confederate capital at Richmond and bring an end to the war. And the campaign failed miserably. The uh, Union Army took a tremendous number of casualties. And so overall, the campaign was um, a failure. And so in the midst of this uh, failed campaign, this image of victory is created. And, and, and within a few days, actually, readers of the newspaper would, would know that um, the actual story was the reverse of what this image seems to imply or indicate. Uh, and this brings us up to another question. So, um, so yes, I do believe that this image was very much designed to be a kind of union propaganda image, as an image that was bolstering the morale of the, of the home front. But it also brings us to the question of, well, how, what did Homer actually witness on the battlefield? And could he have even gotten this close to the action? Uh, and I think the short answer to that question is no. There's probably no way that Homer himself could have witnessed such a scene um, because typically sketch artists weren't allowed to get this close to the um, action. And if you look at it, I mean, it, it's as if the point of view of the spectator of this image is as if we're right there in the midst of the battle. Um, obviously, Homer wasn't, but um, most sketch artists weren't allowed to get anywhere near the, um, the front and this close to the battle. And moreover, most of them complained that they couldn't really see much of anything because of the smoke. You know, there's a lot of artillery and long distance shelling that was used at the time. So it was very, very difficult to actually see the battlefield. So my guess is, my assumption actually, is that Homer just simply invented this image completely out of whole cloth. That it doesn't represent any authentic um, recording of an actual scene on his part at all. We have, we have a question here from Peter Billingsley. Was there a story about the battle to go along with this image, or was the image presented uh, simply uh, to the reader? And then uh, another question uh, relating to the point of view, actually, that you were talking about. Did not, many, uh, did not many people go out for picnics and watch battles? I think that was during the early stages of the war. Yes, they um, did. Uh, that happened in Bull Run, yeah. the first battle of Bull Run. A number of people did go out, and <laughs> they didn't really repeat the experiment because it was so traumatic. Uh, 
uh, you know, it was, it was mostly um, uh, folks from Washington coming out who were expecting a union victory and got a, a, a union defeat. Um, and they, um, uh, it's hard to know how much they would have actually seen from where they were sitting. Um, but in, in any case, there were few people that I have not really heard much of anything after that first battle. And there were a few people, I think, civilians witnessing these battles, except those, you know, the farmers or whoever happened to be living in the area and, and who couldn't get away. Mm -hmm. What about the question of, uh, of context? It disappeared with a story. Yes, and it would have. And, I'm, and I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what the story said at the time, but there was a lag. These illustrations were always keyed to texts in Harper's. And there was usually cross-referencing. So there would be at some point you'd be reading along the story and then the illustration would be referenced. Um, there was a lag time between the, both the story and the image that was published and the final news about what was happening in the, uh, the Peninsula campaign. And it was, as I say, a few days later that it became quite clear that this was a union uh, defeat. Uh, so. Uh, it's easy enough to go back and check that. Oh, there's, um, 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 Harper's is, is fairly easily available online, depending on your access to, um, to electronic databases. But it's all been digitized. And you can actually then see how these images are tied to text. And the text is, very, is usually very interesting, because of course it's a, um, it's a gloss on the image. You know, the text as a way of explaining, helps to explain the image and helps to guide readers in understanding the image or seeing it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you say that Homer, uh, you, you, you speculate that Homer made this up out of whole cloth. Um, I think this may be the way people thought that the Civil War ought to have been fought. Because if you, if you look at D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, this is the way he presents Civil War battles. And of course, that's after the fact. He knows what the battles were really like. And yet in that movie, you have Union troops and, and Confederate troops you know, clashing over a central battle line. And they're, they're very dramatic, heroic battles, just like this one. Right. And, and, and the fact is that that kind of combat was it wasn't unknown in the Civil War. It did happen, but it was rare. It was relatively rare, and it certainly it was rare that that kind of combat was the decisive factor in the battle. Um, one of the reasons that I start with this image is that this was a new kind of war that was fought with much more effective long-distance weaponry than had ever been used in any previous American war. So it was not just artillery that could shell at you know a distance of several hundred yards or more um, but uh, also the rifle itself um, and the bullet the mini so-called mini a bullet that was used in the rifle which allowed um, uh, soldiers to be able to shoot accurately from much farther than the old-fashioned muskets used to be able to do and what that did was to turn the Civil War essentially into a defensive war fought at long range. And that's one reason why there were so many casualties um, and fatalities in the war was because of the advance of the weaponry, the tactics lagged behind the, um, the advances in long distance firing, both by rifles and artillery. So <clears throat> there are a few artists, and we'll talk, we'll get to this in just a moment, there are a few artists that get Homer himself, who begin to grasp this central fact of war, that it's really long distance weaponry um, that is um, controlling the outcome of these battles, and that this kind of personal hand to hand combat is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Okay. Kirk, we have about an hour, so we should move on. Yes, we should move on. So here are a couple of images that Homer himself are, uh, is um, cr creating later in the war which are really about the whole problem of long distance um, battle. And this is a, a fantastic uh, painting that he did of uh, the siege at Petersburg, which is, which, was, uh, which is a really interesting image of trench warfare. Um, Petersburg was of course a battle that was, um, took place over several months and it was very much kind of an anticipation of, of what, of the kind of warfare that would become 
very, very well known in World War I decades later. But it was being pioneered here in the Civil War. So there's a no man's land between the two sides where all the uh, trees are cut down and become stumps so that soldiers can't hide behind them. And this, the day-to-day -day experience of the soldier is basically hiding behind a rampart trying to avoid the sharpshooter fire of the other side in the distance. This is actually from the point of view of the Confederate. It's actually a Confederate trench, and it shows a Confederate soldier who has kind of cracked, uh, who has um, cannot stand, you know, sitting in the trench anymore and jumps up on top of the rampart and dares the other side, dares the Union side to shoot at him. And you can see the two little puffs of smoke in the distance from the sharpshooter rifles that are about to cut him down. Um, it's a, a very poignant image that is really about the kind of psychology of long distance uh, warfare. And it was based, Homer based it, as he did mo many of his really interesting images, he based it on news reports of this kind of thing happening, of, of soldiers kind of going nuts <laughs> and jumping up on top of the ramparts like this. Uh, and you can see he looks like a fighter. He's got his fists, fists clenched. And it's as if he wants that personal kind of hand-to-hand -hand battle, but he's frustrated and can't get it anymore because of the, the nature of warfare has changed. So, and the, the uh, final image that, that I wanted to show in, in relation to this is Homer's actual um, focus on the figure of the sharpshooter. And this, this is actually a sharpshooter, you know, with a special, uh, equipped with this special rifle that could shoot, I think, up to 400 yards accurately, um, looking through a telescopic sight, um, which was also part of the technology here. It was not just the rifle and the bullet, but also the actual um, telescopic sight that allowed the person using, firing the weapon to be able to accurately target um, uh, a a target a very, very long distance away. And one of the things that this image is, I think is really good for, um, it raises the whole issue of the conduct of the war and all of the moral and ethical issues that arose from the these new kinds of uh, weapons, far more effective long distance weapons, that they not only changed the way battles had to be fought by the creation of trench warfare and so on. But they actually changed the kind of moral rules of battle also. Uh, sharpshooters were really hated figures. They were hated not just by the enemy, but actually even by their own troops because of the way in which they changed the kind of um, the rules of battle. Before the sharpshooter became important, became a kind of you know, really central figure, uh, battles were tend, tend to be, you know, they were fought, and then in between battles, soldiers could, could kind of relax. But what the sharpshooter did was to make it so that even in between battles, if the two sides were anywhere near each other, the sharpshooter could pick off targets kind of randomly uh, while battle, even before, while battle was not happening. And a lot of people, even soldiers, but civilians thought of this as murder. They didn't think of this as true kind of battlefield, proper battlefield behavior. And I think it's interesting to use this issue, you know, to use this image and kind of relate it to what um, some of the kinds of issues that have come up in our own time about battle and the conduct of battle. Um, you know, for example, the use of drones, let's say, um, nowadays um, to make attacks on um, uh, uh, civilian compounds that might have a terrorist in it. Um, and, and that would be a kind of an interesting way to kind of raise this issue, the way in which new technologies, in a sense, put pressure on um, moral, uh, raise new and troubling kind of moral questions about, about conduct of war. 
Okay, are there any questions or comments about these two images that we saw, Defiance and now the Sharpshooter image? We've gotten some comments here. Uh, people are commenting on the fact that we, it's ironic that we have things as called rules of war. And uh, Julian Joyner does uh, note that uh, Homer himself considered this uh, type of warfare murder. Yes, he did. He made a comment to that effect at one point. You're absolutely right. And so he was he was really interested in that and kind of the, you can see how the man here in this image almost becomes an extension of the weapon and how the arms themselves become extensions of the rifle and the man becomes totally absorbed in the in the in the sight the telescopic sight so he's almost becoming machine like here and I think Palmer was really really interested in that and again that that's the polar opposite of that idea of kind of personal hand-to-hand -hand combat where kind of men exhibit their valor on the battlefield. There's nothing about this image, there's nothing valorous or heroic about this image at all. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's a really interesting exploration of that, um, of this kind of alternative way of looking at, at war and battle. Now, John Rogers was a, a sculptor who uh, did little, these little plaster figurines uh, that were about 20, 25 inches tall. Um, he made them in multiple versions and sold them. Uh, the way plaster sculpture works is that you can make a, a, an exact plaster duplicate of the model over and over and over again. And he could sell these things for reasonable prices that middle class um, homes could afford. And he made his initial reputation in the Civil War selling, uh, creating little scenes that um, mostly of camp life, we'll see one of them later, uh, that um, he sold sometimes in dozens or maybe even hundreds of copies. Uh, but one of the ones that he did that really failed to sell was this image of, was this group called the Sharpshooters. And you see it here. This was actually the front side of it, uh, and here's the back side of it. And it's, a, it's an interesting uh, example because it shows a uh, uh, Union soldiers basically um, trying to trick the enemy by using a dummy here to draw out that they 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 actually have this kind of dummy or scarecrow soldier, which they put up over the the rampart over the the stone wall try to draw out the enemy side uh, to fire at it. And then when they draw out the enemy side, the enemy um, combatant, the sharpshooter cuts him down. Uh, <clears throat> this was actually a controversial group at the time because it was um, thought to represent something, you know, a kind of a, a, a reliance on trickery to defeat and kill the enemy. And, and again, it raises that issue of the moral conduct of war. Was this an appropriate way to actually fight a battle? And um, it's interesting that Rogers actually produced this little group. He thought it would sell, and uh, apparently it didn't <laughs> because he took it out of his catalog a couple of years later. We have, a, we have an interesting question in the chat, essentially asking, uh, did the sharpshooter originate in the Civil War, or, or were there uh, antecedents to it, that made perhaps in Europe? Um, well, I'm not, by trade, a military historian, so you'll have to take what I say with a, a grain of salt. But my understanding is that, that this was the first use of sharpshooter rifles that we know of. It's certainly the first use in the United States. Um, I believe this preceded preceded the use of weaponry like this in, in, in Europe as well. Um, because the, the this sharpshooter rifle was a very, very new invention at the time. Um, and it relied on the mini A bullet was only, um, and the, the, the kind of apparatus for firing the mini A bullet was only developed in the 1850s. And um, then the sharpshooter rifle was the kind of, um, rifle on steroids you know, that was created um, once the mini-A bullet and the, the process of firing the mini-A bullet were, were um, perfected. So it, it would have been only, you know, th this 
the sharpshooter rifle rifle wasn't even in wide in wide use in the Civil War until the middle the middle of the Civil War. Well, we have a comment. Henry notes here that uh, sharpshooters fought in Europe in the early 19th century um, in Euro European wars, and they originally came from the German states. So perhaps there was some sort of weaponry that uh, allowed some early right. version of the sharpshooter to enter, enter no, battle. No, they no used doubt. a rifle musket, he says. Yeah, well, interesting right. point. Interesting okay. point. Yeah. And so anyway, I'll, I will defer to you. I know that the mini A bullet and the, 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 the mechanism for actually creating the explosive charge that would allow the bullet to be shot was pioneered in, in the, in the mm -hmm. 1850s in the U.S. Okay, we have another question here that we perhaps could address uh, later on as we get into some more of the artwork. Um, Peter Billingsley talks about collateral damage uh, that we talk about in war today, and he was wondering, was there any sort of equivalent term uh, during the Civil War? Certainly civilians were killed during the war. Um, do you know if, if that was labeled in any way, any, any particular way, the way we do today with collateral damage? I don't know of any label um, like that. Certainly not that label that wasn't yeah. used. Um, but I don't, I don't actually know of a label like that because this was, again, this was the, the nation's first experience of what we might call total war in which this kind of mobilization of the civilian population took place and also where the civilian population experienced a lot more of the uh, trauma and dislocation of the war. Um, the collateral damage tends to refer to you know, civilians who die in bombs, bombs that, that are intended for military targets. That particular kind of <clears throat> civilian casualty was rare. You know, occasionally there were stray bullets that hit, uh, you know, somebody. Uh, this happened in Gettysburg. There's a famous case in Gettysburg. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, but that kind of, that kind of civilian fatality was rare. What was much more common, though, was the dislocation of the civilian population, um, hunger of the civilian population because of the destruction of crops um, by typically the Union Army destroying, you know, Confederate uh, crops, um, and also typically the most of the dislocation of the civilian population took place below the Mason-Dixon line, of course, because that's where the war was mainly fought. Uh, and so the civilian population having to flee one side or the other and leave their home. And when, whenever that happens and you have these kind of forced migrations of people happening, there's a lot of disease and death that goes along with that in the civilian population. So that was happening on a much larger scale in the Civil War than had ever been experienced before uh, in the U.S. Okay, Kirk, we have about 45 minutes. <clears throat> All right, well, let's move on to part two the, and the battlefield photographs because I know there's a lot of interest in that. Um, and <laughs> the questions I wanted to ask about that were um, going to look initially at some of the photographs that were taken at the Battle of Antietam in September of um, 1862. And these were, in fact, the first battlefield um, images and they, they were taken in the aftermath of the, battle, of the battle. And so they show the corpses, the decomposing corpses that are left on the battlefield after the battle is over. And the questions, and some of these came up in the forum. How shocking were these photographs? Why were they shocking? Um, what conventions did they upset? The conventions of heroic uh, death and proper care for the dead. So this is a very, very famous one um, that was taken by Alexander Gardner. Um, of a, uh, he, he did actually several photographs. He took several photographs of these bodies that were lined, lined up along a fence on a road, on the Hagerstown Road. Um, and a couple of things to remember here are that the technology of the camera did not, at this point in time, in the 1860s, did not allow for short shutter exposures. So there was, there was no way to take a picture of the battle itself, it would have just been completely blurry. Um, you couldn't take pictures of moving things that were moving. So it could only take photographs of still scenes. And so people who had their portraits taken, for example, by portrait photographers, um, usually had to 
often had to sit for you know 20 or 30 seconds um, in order to get a really good image. So um, the the aftermath of the battle, in a sense, was the perfect image, uh, was the perfect subject at this point in time for what the camera was capable of recording, because of course these are dead bodies and they're not moving. Uh, <clears throat> so, question of of how shocking um, were these images and what kinds of conventions of heroic death or decent burial were violated by these images? Wondering what your thoughts about about this whole subject are. How would they have been seen by people at the time looking at them? And these are the very first images of okay. battlefield corpses that had ever been produced. Anyway. How do you think people would have responded in the 19th century? Um, you, well, first of all, Laura notes that you can tell that this is after the battle because the bodies were bloated. And that would certainly be a shock to the, uh, the 19th century eye. How do you think people responded? Any sense of how this might have violated notions of proper uh, burial and proper care for the dead in the 19th century? Been a lot of scholarship on that lately. Yeah, and one of the, um... here we goes. Was there a Department of Graves uh, registry? Uh, <clears throat> to take care of the war dead. And then I would think that these images would upset the Southerners, especially when the Union dead were buried in some photos, but not the Southerners. Uh, Jolinda uh, jo notes, uh, this would humanize the war for many people instead of just reading about the dead, actually seeing them. Right. How about those responses, Kurt? Okay, yeah, well, those are all interesting questions um, The and responses. The, there was no registry of the dead. Um, remember, these soldiers are not, they, there was no dog tag system. And so it was actually very difficult to identify bodies. Um, the, the bodies that we're looking at in this photograph are indeed Confederate um, soldiers. And in many of the captions for this image that were created later on when the image was marketed, they are identified as Confederate bodies. It'll say view of the Confederate dead, for example, you know, lying where they fell, things like that. The reason for that is that since the Union uh, took, uh, the Union quote unquote won this battle, though its casualties were as, probably as high as the Confederates' casualties, but they, what that meant is that they, they, they retained control of the ground there. And because the Union retained control of the battlefield, they buried their own soldiers first. And then they would only then afterwards bury the Confederate soldiers if they had time or if they chose to. And sometimes they decided they didn't have time or they had to move on or they didn't, for whatever reason, sometimes chose not to bury the enemy dead. And so by the time that Gardner's team of photographers arrived at the battlefield, the Union soldiers were already buried for the most part. And so the images that they had to take were of Confederate bodies. Um, <clears throat> there was the procedures for identifying the bodies were minimal. Um, there was no formal next of kin notification or anything like that going on in either the Union or the Confederate side. So uh, these were very much anonymous deaths that were being recorded out, out here on the battlefield. Um, and uh, let's see, the other uh, question had to do with, go back up to my. Well, there's a good question here from, from Henry Couch. He asks um, about the Northern response to these. Would they have boosted Northern morale or would the, the, would, would the shock of seeing these corpses have been so severe that they might, might have um, short circuited any kind of uh, morale boost that the Northerners might have gotten yeah. from? I, you know, this is a difficult question to answer because we don't have a lot of, you know, documentation about how people actually saw these photographs. That New York Times article from um, October 1862 is a really interesting piece because it goes into some detail about, you know, one person looking at these photographs that were then put on display. These photographs were literally put on exhibition in New York in Matthew Brady's studio. And people came to look at them 
The question is, how were they looking and how were they responding? And this one article gives some interesting hints, but of course it's only one source, and there's not a lot of source material to work with. My own uh, suspicion and impression is that these did not, I would agree that these did not boost morale, because I think these were just, it was very shocking to see unburied bodies, for one thing. I mean, these were um, the, the best source on kind of the, the customs of death and burial at this period of time and, and, and what was going on, how, how these customs were violated during the Civil War is uh, Drew Gelpin Faust's book, Republic of Death, which really goes into a lot of wonderful detail about this. Um, but these were not these were not good deaths in the sense that they were, they were men who were dying hundreds or thousands of miles away from their homes and away from their families and were not properly cared for and properly buried by their own next of kin. And that was very, very shocking. And very shocking also to see these bodies out there unburied. I mean, this really was not what was supposed to happen. So even though they were Confederates, I think the way that the New York Times critic writes about them, he doesn't actually write about them as he doesn't identify them as enemy bodies who are kind of deserving of this horrible treatment. He talks about them in kind of every man terms as if they might be, you know, Union soldiers as well. And the idea that these bodies could be unburied, because anybody looking at this photograph would know that if the Confederates won a battle, this is what was going to happen to the Union soldiers, too. Um, and so that, I think, was, a, was very, very distressing. It's a very distressing thing to, for, for people then to contemplate. And the fact that they could not, you know, they could not kind of cleanse the body, the whole, all of the, um, the fears that this would play into uh, the, the audience at that time. You have to think about mothers or daughters or wives looking at these images and thinking that their son or husband or um, you know, father could die in this way and not be buried properly and not be cleansed by their own family members and so on. I think I think made made these these images would certainly have made these images I think very very shocking. And yet there was a market for them. You know, and people bought them. Uh, Samantha Bowman makes an interesting point. She writes, it would be interesting to get students thinking about showing bodies uh, in these pictures, which I don't think would bother them very much, as opposed to showing them victims of Hurricane Katrina, uh, which they are usually opposed to in uh, classroom discussion. Um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, I don't, we don't have time to explore that now, but it does show, um, show uh, I think, war photographs. We are accustomed to those. Other bodies in other contexts, uh, might be shocking to us the way these shocked the 19th century eye. Well, one thing I, I would like to add one point to that, which is I, you know, I teach these, I teach in college, so I teach these images to college kids. But even college kids now um, find these images to be very, very puzzling and disturbing because they're not used to seeing images of, of battle dead in in recent wars. We we don't see images of American soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan dead on the battlefield or even wounded um, because there is a, 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 such a high degree of censorship of um, the imagery coming out of those wars and, and that imagery is controlled essentially by the Pentagon. And so for them when they see these pictures, they just, at first they just don't compute at all. They don't understand how these pictures were even allowed to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an interesting kind of, I think, way into the subject as well to kind of compare, you know, it shows you just how different things were in, you know, the 1860s as opposed to the 2000 and, you know, teens. Well, Merlina notes that students uh, might not be shocked uh, by these images today because of movies and games that are out today and are so full of blood and gore. Uh, that they find they would find these tames tame that might be true, but a lot of those games I gather that the violence is kind of stylized i i, I don't know it would be interesting to to, um, yeah. to hear what the teachers well, uh, it, would it find would with a, these images yeah, that is an interesting point, and again it's something I think to explore with your students um those are you know invented images, and I find that my students are are don't it's not easy for them to look at these pictures because they're not video games and they're not movies. I mean, they know these are real bodies. 
and they can see that these bodies are decomposing. And um, if you, you can go in a very high magnification on these images, you can get them from the Library of Congress and you can download them in very high resolution images and you can go in and look at the bloating, you can look at the way the faces are distorted um, and the, the mouth is distorted by decomposition. And it's very, very difficult to look at. And in fact, I warn my students in advance uh, when we look at these pictures because um, because they are, they can be so disturbing to look at. We're, what we're looking at on the screen now is very small kind of low resolution image. You should get a, you know, a higher resolution version of the image and zoom in on it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, good, I think we need to move on. Uh-huh. Uh, so this was, and this brings up a lot of the issues that we've just been talking about. This is an image about burial, you know, and, and, and about the contrast between the way in which, you know, Confederate and Union or federal troops, as they were called here, were, were handled um, at the Battle of Antietam. Because there's, there's a, a, a fresh grave here, which is a, a federal grave, federal buried, Confederate unburied, and then there's this Confederate body just lying there on the ground. Uh, and the man standing here in the picture, who is <clears throat> not doing anything, just standing there and not doing anything to bury the soldier, the Confederate soldier who's left uh, on the ground. And and there was some commentary about this, you know, the sense of you know why why is this man simply standing there when um, he could actually be, um, you know, giving this this Confederate dead a decent burial. Now this is obviously a staged photograph. This is a photograph that because we know it in several different versions. Some of them have, some of the versions of this image have the standing figure and some don't have the standing figure. So Gardner took a number of different images of these and he's making a point here. He's making a point about burial practices um, in, the, um, in the Civil War and he's really raising this issue is really putting it out there for, in a sense, you know, for public, almost public debate and consciousness. Uh, and that gets me to the issue of the staging of battlefield photographs. And this might be an interesting, this, this photograph I thought might really be an interesting example to use in the way in which one of the participants suggested. You know, maybe you put this photograph up at the beginning of class, have the students write a few lines about it, describe it and then begin to talk in more detail about how a photograph like this was made. Um, because it's been very conclusively demonstrated, you know, a few decades ago, it was very conclusively demonstrated that, that this body was dragged by the photographer to this particular location. Uh, this rifle was a prop that the, that the um, camera crew had and they set it up they set up both the rifle and the body to make it look like this was where this um, body, where this Confederate soldier died. Um, he may or may not have been a sharpshooter. He probably wasn't a sharpshooter. The, the way that they know that this was staged is that um, you can actually see this very same body in several different photographs in several different locations. Um, the resolution on the photographs, the photographs were so beautifully detailed because of the long shutter times uh, that you can conclusively demonstrate that this particular body was in several different locations. And then the guy who did the, the research on it actually went out to Gettysburg and he discovered exactly where the body was in these various different locations and how it had been dragged from place to place and how far they had dragged it. Quick, quick question. Uh, is this Devil's Den at Gettysburg? Or, yes, you know? it's in that, right, it's in that general area. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this raises some questions about the whole issue of documentary photography. And um, why were these photographs made? Why were they staged in, in this way? So this is a nice example to use with students because you can, students will tend to read it initially as a, as a document. They'll say, okay, the photographer came upon this scene and snapped this photograph. Um, and are very surprised to learn that the photographer actually staged the scene. 
and to the point of actually manipulating dead bodies and carrying them, dragging them from place to place, putting them into position, um, changing the posture, and so on and so forth. And then the, that raises a whole series of questions about why the photographer was doing it, and um, which we can really only kind of speculate um, about. But I think one of the things that this image does is that it creates a storyline. So unlike the Antietam picture that we started with, which really just looks like random death, I mean, these look like these are random postures as if these bodies were almost like dropped out of a out of the sky onto the ground and they're all in rigor mortis uh, in very contorted um, and distorted and random positions unlike that kind of image this body maintains a certain dignity in death probably because again because the photographer arranged the body that way there's a storyline that we can that we can um, invent around this image. We can imagine that this that this guy was um, a sharpshooter behind this wall of rocks, and that he was you know later killed in the battle, maybe by forces coming from behind or so on. And, and so we can kind of tell a whole human story, and it's just one person in the image, and he sort of stands for everybody. And I see early version of Photoshop, and you're absolutely right. There were ways to this was what we might call pre-processing of the image, right? Um, in which the image is set up before the photograph is even actually taken. But there was actually post-processing that could be done as well in the darkroom to change the way in which an image could be seen. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we have a question from Greg here. Did artists ever use some of their own crew to complete images? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what, what he would mean, but did, did artists have crews out in the field? Well, they did. I mean, all the photographers worked in crews um, at, in the battlefields because they had to bring, the way the process worked, they had to bring their darkroom with them. These were glass plate negatives that they took photographs on. And once they took the photograph and exposed the glass plate to, you know, 60 seconds or whatever it was of light, of a uh, exposure time, then they had to take the glass plate out and carry it over to the dark room, which was in a it, literally in a mobile cart, and and used it, which was set up with all the chemicals and processed the glass the, the uh, glass plate right there on site, and so they needed uh, you know they needed two or three guys they needed you know a crew of people to set up the photographs they needed more people to process the the plates there on the site. So it was very much of a team effort mm -hmm. to create and, these images. And one quick question here before we move on. Did Gibson uh, apply the title Home of a Rebel Sharpshooter to this image, or did that come later on? That came later on. Oh, okay. Um, so the, but, it, but it was probably, this was a, um, Gibson was the photographer, so he created the negative. The positive print, uh, cr the paper print created from the glass plate negative was done by Alexander Gardner and his his company. Gardner was the, um, hired a crew of people, including Gibson and, and Timothy O'Sullivan and some other folks. Um, and so Gardner was the one who, who created the, um, the caption for the image that was then sold in his catalog. Uh, this, this image was also then used in Gardner's book, his al photographic album that he published in 1866 after the war. And he right. has text that goes along with it. Okay, so that would suggest uh, perhaps a little propagandistic use here, a touch of irony to the narrative that you just described, home of a rebel sharpshooter. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. And again, that that you know that's a, a, a creation of a narrative with with ironic content, uh, but the, the kind of domesticity, you know, the kind of invocation of a domestic setting here in the midst of these rocks. Sure. We've got about a half an hour, Kirk. Should we move on? Yeah. And so finally, the final photograph that I wanted to mention was this one here, which also appeared in um, a different photographer, but it was also an image that was controlled by Alexander Gardner and appeared in his photographic sketchbook after the war. Um, this is another, I think, excellent one to use with students um, because it's a very um, – uh, shocking but also unexpected image because it, it looks to be a kind of cleanup that's taking place after a battle, but it's actually not at all. It's actually taking place months after the battle was fought. 
And this was a case in which this was a Confederate victory at Cold Springs in 1864. Uh, and so these are Union bodies that were left out on the battlefield and that were not buried either by the Confederate Army or by the locals in that area. Uh, and so it was left to, it wasn't until April of 1865 at the conclusion of the war when this area was retaken by Union forces that the kind of final disposition of these bodies took place where they were finally given actual burials. And by this time, the bodies are decomposed to largely the skeletons and the actual work is being done by African-Americans. Um, I'm not sure, I'm assuming that these were local um, probably in the local uh, slave or freed slave population who were impre impre impressed into service in order to do this kind of battlefield work. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Samantha. Were these soldiers African Americans? Do we know? The ones who died here. Right. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. There, there may have been uh, African American units there, mm -hmm. but I don't know whether you know, the bodies that were left on the battlefield were or not. But it's a really, okay. really great question. You know. um, this um, was talked about, Gardner talked about this and had a, a page long text about this photograph in his sketchbook of the war that he published in 1866. And basically he used it to kind of indict, sorry, the local population for not properly burying Union troops. But he didn't mention anything about the troops themselves being colored or African American. Okay. All right. So um, I wanted to look at the whole issue of um, slaves, contraband, and freedmen, which was a, became a very, very important subject in 1862, 1863, as the Emancipation Proclamation loomed and as slaves themselves began to escape um, from. Confederate territory in very large numbers starting in 1862 kind of took destiny into their own hands and became their own liberators. Um, and the John Rogers piece, this is the fellow I talked about earlier who made the, the plaster casts uh, and sold to middle, a middle class market. He um, did a, an interesting little piece on this uh, with the campfire cook who is African-American and is almost certainly um, a, what was then called the contraband, somebody, probably a slave who had fled to a Union fort and who was um, then being pressed into services to cook for Union soldiers. He's listening to a Union soldier reading the newspaper. It's a very, very interesting piece, but we don't have a lot of time to deal with it, so I'm going to move on to the uh, work that I think is really, really suggestive. Um, and that was actually created directly in response to the Emancipation Proclamation by this sculptor, John Quincy Adams um, Ward. A little bronze piece, initially it was created as a plaster piece and was exhibited in May of 1863 in New York City and, and then created a little bit later in a bronze version. And there's several bronze versions of it in museums around the country. It's a really spectacular piece. It's about 20, 21 inches high, so it's it's not a life-size statue, it's a statuette. And um, some of the questions here that we, you know, I was comparing it to the protagonist in uh, the campfire um, scene that we just saw. Um, this is obviously very different. It's focusing on the African-American. There's no other figure in the group, in the group at all. And I raised the question of what it feels like to take the pose of the statue. And that's an interesting exercise. Again, I, I recommend it for you uh, to give to students is to actually, it's kind of fun to get them up and out of their chairs and <laughs> to have them actually take the pose because they can feel it in a certain way. It gives them a different kind of information about the piece. Then the larger question about the meaning of it, what, what future prospects does this situation suggest? In order to answer that question, we have to look at this as, a, as a, a figure that is part of a narrative, that is meant to suggest a narrative, and whose narrative is really tied to the Emancipation Proclamation. Because of course what the Emancipation Proclamation did when Lincoln issued it, it didn't free anybody immediately, but it, what it did was to encourage slaves in Confederate territory to escape 
to the Union side because if they did so successfully or if they were liberated by Union forces, they became free by this proclamation. And so this is a fugitive, the idea here is that this is a fugitive slave who has um, escaped from his plantation or wherever he was and is on the road to freedom. And so he's in between slavery and freedom. And the sculptor very self-consciously designed him to be that way. He is not yet, he, he has left slavery, but he has not yet achieved freedom. He's in between these two states. And he there, therefore became a kind of allegory for the whole subject of um, emancipation in the in the United States at this time, and for the position of African Americans at this time, as they were kind of in between slavery and freedom. So as they were leaving slavery, what would freedom mean for them? Uh, and he does it in the language of, of sculpture in, in a lot of very, very kind of sophisticated and subtle, um, subtle ways. So for example, by having him be largely unclothed by putting him into a posture that is really neither sitting nor standing. He's in between the two, having him gaze across to the horizon as if he's looking for potential dangers. He's resting on the road to freedom, but he's still anxious because he doesn't know what awaits him uh, either forward or backwards. Are there any questions about this piece? Because it's, <coughs> it's a, complex piece actually it seems simple but it's a complex piece any questions <clears throat> about this you, you, one of the questions that you asked uh, was about the future prospects and uh, um, certainly this this figure is an intelligent looking uh, figure and certainly uh, uh, suggests a lot of physical strength so those are some resources that uh, he certainly brings into freedom Right, and then the question becomes, what is he going to find once he arrives? It's really not quite right, because he isn't actually yet free. He's in the process of becoming free, as all of his you know, compatriots are now. And so it's a process that is still ongoing. It hasn't been completed yet. So Ward was really, he was really intelligent and self-conscious about this subject. This was kind of a man in the process of becoming something new. And how that was going to turn out, and Ward himself said that in the letter, how that was going to turn out, nobody knew at the time. And of course, that would become the central issue of Reconstruction after the war is what is the meaning of freedom for African Americans? What kinds of rights and responsibilities would they be given? Would they have the right to vote? Would they have, you know, be given land and all that sort of stuff? Jack Carter asks, what does the back side of the piece look like? Is there any anything there that would be uh, uh, significant for us to consider? Oh, well, I like to see have whip marks. No, oh, um, there you go. he doesn't. And um, there isn't that. You don't really get a whole lot of new information by looking at the back of the piece, which is interesting. It really does have a front view. Um, and one of the things about his body that was remarked on at the time was that it was totally flawless. And so... Um, it was very much kind of idealized. Uh, and this is in stark contrast to the images like this that began to appear in places like Harper's Weekly. This is, um, so this is an image that came out, you know, barely a month after uh, Ward's figure of the Freedman was exhibited in New York in New York City. Uh, this image was made um, for the July 4th issue, uh, 1863 issue of Harper's Weekly. And it's a very, very famous image. You probably, I'm, I'm sure many of you have probably already seen it reproduced. And it does, in fact, show the front and the back. And it's a before and after image. Uh, so you, the idea is you see the, the man as he entered the Union li lines as a kind of ex slave, a slave, a fugitive slave in tatters, sitting down. And then you see him in the uniform of a U.S. soldier standing up and now in uniform um, and holding a gun. And so it's that transformation of the slave to a soldier that is what the image is largely about, but in the middle, showing the way in which he's been brutalized uh, in slavery. So this could be really considered a kind of propaganda 
image. It's doing a number of different things. It's obviously indicting, you know, the slave system for its brutal brutalization of human beings. It's also then applauding the union side for taking these lowly slaves who arise in tatters and turning them into proud men who become soldiers. Um, and, and there was a whole genre of this imagery of these kind of so-called before and after images that you see in photography as well. You'll see, uh, you know, uh, uh, and these were almost certainly staged photographs where they would, in other words, they would take the same person and they put them in, you know, the same black person, put, put him in tattered clothing, snap his picture, then put him into the uniform of a soldier and snap his picture and then sell them as pictures side by side. Okay, any questions about this one? Okay, Kirk, we could move on then. All right. So, and the final image that I wanted to show in this vein about the um, the idea of the status of the African Americans during wartime uh, is this really interesting painting by Winslow Homer. Um, Homer, as I told you, he began his career as a as a sketch artist for Harper's Weekly. Uh, and then over the course of the Civil War, he began to experiment with painting and he made the transition to become a painter over the course of the war years. And this was one of his early paintings that he did um, of the war that was actually um, little known at the time. He did it in 1865, 1866. And it kind of disappeared from view for, view for about a century before it was um, acquired by the New York, New York Museum of Art. And there's actually a, a new book about, about this image, an entire book about this one painting by Peter Wood that's very, I highly recommend to you. It's a slim volume, but very, very interesting. Uh, but anyway, this, this is a really resonant image because what you see is unlike, what's really unique about the image is that the African-American woman is, is the center of the image. And so instead of being the marginal figure in the image, as they were in most images, paintings of that time, she is the protagonist. She's front and center and occupies the bulk of the picture. And what you see off to the side is a little vignette in the upper left corner of Union soldiers being taken as prisoners by Confederates and sent uh, to Andersonville Prison. Andersonville Prison, of course, was this very notorious prisoner of war camp run by the Confederacy, where something I forget, 12 to 15,000 or something uh, Union soldiers died from malnutrition and disease because they were overcrowded. And the only um, Confederate who was actually ever convicted of war crimes was the commander of this camp, Andersonville camp. And his trial was in the fall of 1865. We probably guessed that Homer probably began the picture at that period of time, probably in the fall of 1865, when that was in the news. Um, but it, you know, instead of creating a picture directly about Andersonville and the camp, he creates a picture from the point of view of this black woman who's most likely a slave here in Georgia, where the Andersonville was, looking at the scene, um, watching these Union prisoners being taken to a prisoner of war camp. And so the, the image is really great. It's full of all kinds of wonderful clues. There are gourds and so on in it that sort of suggest things about her future. And, you know, the whole question is, again, it's the same kind of, in a way, the same kind of question that's posed by the freedmen. What is, what's the end of the story is really the question that Homer is posing. Mm -hmm. It's an open-ended picture with an open-ended, you know, conclusion. Uh, you know, <clears throat> she's emerging from a doorway and the planking in front of her goes off in two different directions. Right. So she's literally at kind of a crossroads. Exactly, and that's very much talked about by Peter Wood in his book, you know, the question of the path that she's going to take and the path that society is going to take as it approaches the question of how to absorb the freed slave population into the, um, into the new nation after the Civil War. So finally, uh, let's see, how much time do we have? We have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, the aftermath of the war is something, of course, that, that artists and um, image makers would take up in, in lots of interesting ways, and we can only sort of suggest the tip of the iceberg here. Winslow Homer, 
famous image of prisoners from the front in which he has a Union commander confronting these sort of defiant um, a group of, of rebel prisoners, um, one of whom is a kind of defiant figure and others who are, you know, a, very, a kind of mixture of figures that he um, is confronting became, a, again, a kind of allegory for the confrontation of the two sides and the question of reconciliation after the Civil War. Uh, like most of Homer's pictures, they're always open-ended. The question is, how is this going to end up? What's the conclusion of the story going to be? And he's leaving audiences, in a sense, open. He's, he's letting the audience uh, decide, that, decide that question. Um, but then much more polemical imagery like this, this again is a Harper, an image that appeared in Harper's Weekly, which is really about the failure of reconstruction here. It's about the, the um, uh, you know, it's from 1868, so it's about the counterattack by the ex-Confederates and the Klan and, you know, the other organized groups in the South that are trying to repress the black vote and repress the white unionist vote at this period of time, uh, in some cases violent, doing so violently by, you know, murdering people or hounding them out of, of their homes. Uh, and he represents it in this wonderfully ironic way as a monument with this um, black man on top of the monument in basically in despair with his gun at his feet, unable to prevent the massacre of you know his fellow people, perhaps it's even his wife and child at the base of the monument. Uh, it's a very rich image that it's a it's a really good one for using, opening up the questions of reconstruction and how how this kind of um, terrorist struggle that was going on in the in the South after the war was being represented um, for a while by by pro Union newspapers like Harper's Weekly. Um, we're not going to talk about common soldier monuments in in this class because we just had a, a seminar on that recently, and I think I responded in the forum to some of you who are interested in that whole question and gave you some sources that you could look at. But there is the whole question of how the abolition abolition of slavery, which was the of course the major moral outcome of the Civil War, how that was represented by artists, for example, in, in public monuments. And this is a really notorious example that of the Freedmen's Memorial to Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C. that was erected really at the close of Reconstruction. 1876 was kind of the official end of Reconstruction. Um, and showing the slave in the same kneeling abject pose that he was represented in by abolitionists long before the war was fought, you know, this image goes back to the 1830s, essentially this standard image of the black man kneeling, um, but here he's paired with Lincoln as a kind of savior figure who holds the Emancipation Proclamation above him. And became, this image became the single most influential, uh, almost iconic image of emancipation in the United States. And it's a very misleading and destructive image in a lot of ways because what it does is deprive the African American and the freed slave population of any sense of agency. So whereas they were largely responsible for the train of events that led to the Emancipation Proclamation by fleeing slavery, taking their destiny into their own hands, they're here represented as simply the passive receivers of a gift of freedom from Abraham Lincoln. And finally, uh, that image is interesting, I think, to pair with a very different image that responds to the same events, to the same, um, the, um, the outcome of the war and the, and the emancipation the, uh, of African Americans. Uh, this is by an African American woman herself named Elizabeth Keckley, and it's this wonderful quilt that she made. She was the dressmaker for Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, she was a free, uh, She'd been born a slave. She purchased her own freedom, became a very prominent, fashionable seamstress in Washington, D.C., became Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress, in fact, lived at the White House, and um, uh, published a memoir about it after, afterwards. Well, her son, 
who was actually a biracial child. He was the product. She was raped by a, a, a white master when she was still a slave as a teenager and gave birth to her son then, and, and he could pass for white. And so he actually joined the Union Army in 1861 as a white soldier and died very early in the war in August of 1861. So this had a personal meaning for her. But if we go in on that central panel of the quilt, uh, it is so-called liberty quilt because there's the word liberty there and um, the eagle, the American eagle, is holding that word in its mouth. And so this is a quilt that she has self-designed as a kind of memorial, I think, to her son, but also to the idea uh, of liberty and emancipation that the war represented for her. So it's a kind of alternative to the official the more official commemoration of the war in, in a monument like the Freedmen's Memorial to Abraham Lincoln. It's a, a sort of private um, uh, memorial that she herself created. It was never put on public display, but was preserved, carefully preserved, because she was an important person and uh, is now in a museum at Kent State in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Do we know, uh, Kirk, if uh, there is a tradition of uh, liberty quilts like this? Was this something that uh, <clears throat> many African Americans did? There was, and that's, and that's a good point. And, one, and I'm glad you reminded me, because that's one of the reasons I want to put up the slide, is that, is that quilt making was a, a way in which um, African Americans could actually kind of record their own memories and even indeed collective memories of the war. And so there is a tradition, for example, of you know using of sewing bits and pieces of Union uniforms into quilts as an, as an example of a way of remembering the service of African Americans in the Civil War. Because generally, after the end of Reconstruction, the whole story of the 180,000 African American men who fought in the Union Army for their own liberation that story was largely forgotten by white culture but was maintained within African-American communities by their own memory networks and their own forms of remembering, the quilt making being one of them, uh, one of the ways in which they could kind of nurture this memory um, during that very dark period in American history when they were living in, in the Jim Crow system. So these were private commemorations. Were there yeah. any public commemorations of the uh, African-American contribution to the war? Well, no, there weren't. I mean, you know, the Freedmen's Memorial to Abraham Lincoln, if we go back to that, what's so interesting about this project is that it was actually funded by African Americans. So this was actually supposed to be their kind of commemoration of Lincoln, um, but they ha had nothing to do with the design um, or placement or creation of the monument. They funded it, but the actual, it was actually a white organization that chose the sculpture and it was a white sculptor who created it. Um, so it wasn't until, you know, really after the Civil Rights Movement that African Americans got the kind of authority to actually exercise their own voice in the official public sphere. I see. Okay. Well, we have come to the end of our uh, seminar. Let me just wrap up these last those slides here and ask if there are any final questions, thoughts, or comments before we wrap things up. We went through some images there at the end rather quickly. Any comments um, uh, anything on, on anything we've, we've talked about today before we close things? Can we have some comments here thanking us? Well, I'm glad everyone enjoyed the, uh, the seminar, at least Amy did. Any final thoughts or comments? Okay, it's your last chance. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we will monitor the form until March 15th. So if you do have any uh, questions or comments now that uh, didn't get into the seminar, please put them on the form. We'll respond to you there. Um, the next seminar we'll do will be the meaning of the West in late 19th century America. Elliot West from the University of Arkansas will lead that one for us. That will be on May 10th. Please remember to submit your evaluations. Uh, as I said, those are very important to us. And I want to thank Kirk for giving us an excellent seminar. And I want to thank all of you for your intelligent and enthusiastic participation today. See you again on May 10th. And I think all of you know how to, uh, to exit the classroom. So again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll be back with you in a few months. Thank you very much. <laughs>